die suffering at the hands of Rome because they believed in Christ alone. They died through Europe, especially Spain, for they saw all but Christ in vain. He suffered by his death for men to save them from their awful sin. Six hundred years of martyred saints that history cannot erase with iron heel and iron hand. The Roman popes rule the land, those ignorant of history may be swept into apostasy. We won't be loved by Rome, sweet lie, with 50 million reasons why. Salvation is by faith alone, in Christ alone, by grace alone. A sovereign God give faith to man, salvation's in the Maker's hand. This gospel offends Rome today. They offer up another way, a counterfeit, a compromise. Beware the ancient papal lie with such a cloud of witnesses who by grace died in their Lord. Recall their memory to say, by the same faith we live today. Good evening. Welcome to Walt's Mystery Babylon News Radio. My name's Tom Press, and I'll be hosting for the next two hours. We'll continue our reading and discussion of the book Romanism and the Reformation by Henry Grattan Guinness. We will have one hour of reading and then hopefully an hour of fruitful discussion. Walt will lead the discussion this evening, and I'll go back to work. We'll start now on page 197 of the book. And remember, last time we were talking, and we'll continue to talk a bit tonight, about what the early church fathers believed in regards to Bible prophecy. Did they believe that the Antichrist would not appear until the last seven years before Christ's return? Or did they believe that the appearance of Antichrist in the world was imminent? We're going to find out that the early church fathers, contrary to what is taught us in the churches, from the very writings of the early church fathers, we, we understand, we, we know from their own writing that they believe that the, that the appearance of Antichrist was imminent and that the rise of Antichrist would take place just as soon as the restrainer was taken out of the way. And they believe that that restrainer was the Roman Caesars, under the pagan Roman Caesars, when that power that ruled the Roman Empire, remember the, the, the prophecies of Daniel, first there would be the Babylonian Empire, then the Medo-Persian Empire, which would be defeated by the Grecian Empire, which would be defeated by the pagan Roman Empire under the Caesars. They, they had seen all of these things take place, and Rome was currently in power at the time when Christ walked the streets of Jerusalem. The, the apostles were under Roman control. Jerusalem was under Roman control. All of the world was under Roman control at that time. That fourth and final empire, according to Daniel's prophecy, would continue until Christ's return. Obviously, we know Christ has not returned, and therefore we can understand if we believe the Bible, if we believe Daniel to be a prophet of God, we have, we have but one choice, and that is to believe that Rome is in control and has been in control ever since the first century. It's Rome that rules the world. And according to Daniel's prophecy, that Roman rule will continue until Christ's return. 
Now, many will have us believe that the Jews rule the world that the Roman Empire has fallen and the Jews now are going to rule the world. That is a denial of Daniel's prophecy. That is a grievous error. And it has caught a vast percentage of the Christian church today. People believe that God is going to deal now with the Jews and the Jews are going to have an empire that's going to last a thousand years. They don't understand the scriptures. Now, we're going to learn tonight, as we did last time, that the early Christians, even those under Paul's ministry, the Thessalonians, believed that Rome was soon to be toppled and replaced by another Roman power. And whoever replaced the Roman Caesars would be that man of sin, the son of perdition the Antichrist of Scripture. And they were so apprehensive about the rise of this Antichrist, this man of sin, this son of perdition, that they literally prayed for the longevity of the pagan Roman Empire. The pagan Roman Empire that, that fed Christians to the lions in the Colosseum in Rome. They were praying, literally praying for the longevity And the last time when we were on here, we literally read the prayer that they prayed in communion in in asking God's protection of the Caesars. As extraordinary as that may sound, as brutal as the pagan Roman Caesars were against the Christians, they prayed for the longevity of the Caesars so that he would continue to restrain the rise of Antichrist. Now, is that futurism or is that historicism? We're going to continue now with the the quote from another of the early church fathers, as they are called, this one by the name of Chrysostom. We read the words of Chrysostom. Now, I'm beginning on about halfway down page 197, if you're following along in the online version. Read the words of Chrysostom in his commentary on Second Thessalonians. Listen to what Chrysostom says. Quote, One may first naturally inquire, what is that which withholdeth? And after that would know why Paul expresses this so obscurely. Quote, he who now let us, remember he's talking about the Caesars. He can't mention it verbatim in this, in this letter in case it would fall into Roman hands and he would be found a, a, a traitor or treason, uh, come under charges of treason, or perhaps being accused of inciting an overthrow of the Roman government. Okay, listen to what he says. Paul says, quote, He who now letteth, the Caesars, will let until he be taken out of the way, unquote. That is when the Roman Empire is taken out of the way, that is the pagan Roman Empire, taken out of the way, then he shall come. Then Antichrist shall come. And naturally, for as long as the fear of this empire lasts, the pagan Roman Empire, no one would readily exalt himself. In other words, no one would stand up. This, this Antichrist could never dare stand up and proclaim himself the head of the Roman Empire when the Caesar was still in power. All right? And he continues, he says, but when that is dissolved, that is, when the Caesar's power is dissolved, he will attack the anarchy and endeavor to seize upon the government both of men and of God. All right? So here we have, let me read the quote without commentary. You listen to it. This is Chrysostom, one of the early church fathers. He says, that is when the Roman Empire is taken out of the way, then he shall come. And naturally, for as long as the fear of this empire lasts, 
no one will readily exalt himself. But when that is dissolved, he will attack the anarchy and endeavor to seize upon the government both of men and of God. Now look, the Caesars always saw themselves as an emanation of God. They were God-men, okay? But look what replaced it. The papacy calls himself the vicar of Christ, the replacement of the Son of God on earth. And he has sought both the government of men and of God. Okay? The papacy has on its flag two keys that represent the Pope's spiritual power and his temporal power. That makes him God on earth and also the ultimate civil governor of the world. He is both he is both priest and king according to the Roman Catholic belief as it were Christ on earth and he also is king of kings and lord of lords. That makes him the civil governor of the world, not just the spiritual leader of the world as many tout him to be, but also head of all the governments of the world by divine right. Now, most people don't know this about the papacy because they don't suspect the papacy of being anything in the world. But the papacy is that power that overthrew or replaced the Caesars when the Caesars were taken out of the way. And the papacy during the old world order literally controlled all the kings of the earth. He literally put their crowns upon their heads and asserting to himself the power to put that crown on a king's head, he also reserved for himself the power to remove that crown if that governor, if that king of one of the nations dared to defy the, the demands of the pope, the government of the pope. So it was through the kings of the earth that the papacy ruled the world after the Caesars were taken out of the way. Now, this is history. This is the fulfillment of Bible prophecy in history. Long ago, of the third or fourth century. But the churches would have us believe that this restrainer won't be taken out of the way until nearly before Christ comes. They've taught this in the, in the Protestant churches and the evangelical churches for nigh unto three or four generations now. But everyone prior to those three or four generations believed the papacy was the Antichrist and fulfilled all the prophecies regarding the Antichrist in the Bible. And that the papacy killed more of God's people than the Caesars ever dreamt of. And that's exactly why they prayed for the longevity of the Caesars, because the prophecies were clear that the Antichrist would persecute the saints, would wear out the saints of the Most High. And that's why they feared the rise of this power that would replace the Caesars. And this is what Chrysostom believed. He said, read the words of Chrysostom in his commentary on Second Thessalonians, Chrysostom's going to comment on that passage in Second Thessalonians where, where Paul is speaking. He says, quote, One may first naturally inquire, what is that which withholdeth? And after that would know why Paul expresses this so, so obscurely. Quote, He who now letteth will let until he be taken out of the way. Unquote. That is, when the Roman Empire is taken out of the way, then he shall come. And naturally, for as long as the fear of this empire lasts, no one would readily, uh, readily exalt himself. But when that is dissolved, he will attack the anarchy and endeavor to seize upon the government 
both of men and of God. What insight Chrysostom had, because that's exactly the way it played out. He seized upon the government both of men and of God. No futurism in what Chrysostom believed, only historicism. Now it continues. For as the kingdoms before this were destroyed, that of the Medes by the Babylonians, that of the Babylonians by the Persians, that of the Persians by the Macedonians or the Greeks, that of the Greeks by the Romans, so will this be by Antichrist. That is, so will the pagan Roman Empire be destroyed by Antichrist. And who destroyed the pagan Roman Empire? The papacy. This is perfect fulfillment. And he concludes his quote by saying this, and he by Christ. That means the Antichrist will be destroyed by Christ. It's exactly the way this played out so far in history. He believed that the four kingdoms, Babylon, Medo-Persia, Greece, and Rome, were all going to be destroyed, and all had been destroyed, except at that time, the pagan Roman Empire, and it would soon be destroyed by the Antichrist, the Pope, and then he would be destroyed by Christ. And that's the perfect fulfillment of Daniel's prophecy. All right, he continues. He says, then according, uh, accounting for Paul's reserve, in alluding to this point, he adds, quote, because he says this of the Roman Empire. He naturally only glanced at it and spoke covertly, in other words, secretly, for he did not wish to bring upon himself superfluous enmities and useless dangers. For if he had said that, after a little while the Roman Empire would be dissolved, they would now immediately have even overwhelmed him as a pestilential person and all the faithful as living and warring to this end. Unquote. So Chrysostom is now explaining why Paul spoke so covertly in his letter about this restrainer. He was afraid his letter would fall into Roman hands and that he would not only be endangering himself, but he would be endangering God's people. But remember, Paul said, when I was with you, I told you these things. Paul, Paul brings up even in his letter of what he discussed with them when he was in person with them, when he was personally with the Thessalonians. He didn't speak in clandestine terms. He didn't speak covertly. He plainly told the Thessalonians that whenever the Caesars the power of the Caesars is destroyed, then that man of sin will be revealed and will stand up in his place. But look, the Thessalonians believed that when the Caesars were destroyed, Antichrist would stand up in his place. The very Antichrist of Daniel's prophecy the very one that Paul prophesied about, the very one that John the, uh, of the Apocalypse prophesied about. Now you understand why they prayed so fervently for the continuation and the preservation of the pagan Roman Caesars. They knew Antichrist's arrival and appearance in the world was imminent, and they were absolutely correct. And up until the last three generations of Christians, that's what they believed, that the papacy was the Antichrist. The fulfillment of all the prophecies regarding Antichrist are fulfilled in the papacy. It's only our generation and the generation of our mothers and fathers and the generation of our grandparents that were deceived into believing that the Antichrist wouldn't come until the last seven or three and a half years before Christ's return. 
We simply must repent of futurism. And we must take a close, careful look at the history of the Roman Catholic Church and the history of the, of the, of the papacy and be assured that these early church fathers, Chrysostom being just one, was absolutely correct in their interpretation of the prophecies. And we must then examine how much power the papacy has over our government, how much control the papacy has over the government of the United States. Have we been sold out by our government as subjects of the pope? I'm afraid that's exactly what you're going to find out when you study this. And we would never have allowed ourselves to be entangled with the government of the United States and so dependent upon the government of the United States had we remained separate from the civil power, knowing that the civil powers served the Antichrist of the Bible, the papacy. But not knowing who the Antichrist is, we are left to believe that our government is sovereign and it rules of, by, and for the people. But it does not rule of, by, and for the people. It rules of, by, and for the papacy. And that's why we are so entangled with Social Security and Medicare and Medicaid and, and uh, all the entitlements and things. We were never to be entangled with a human government. We have a king, we have a kingdom, and he takes care of his own. What each and every one of us does, in depending upon the federal government of this country, is doing exactly what Daniel refused to do when he was in Babylonian captivity. He would never eat from King Nebuchadnezzar, Nebuchadnezzar's table. He was never dependent upon Nebuchadnezzar. He says, give me water and pulse to drink. Give me pulse and water to drink. He would not eat from the king's table. He didn't want to be entangled with Nebuchadnezzar because Nebuchadnezzar, even though he was, rule, he was ruler over Daniel, he was not Daniel's king. Daniel had a king, and he worshiped and obeyed that king. And never mind what Nebuchadnezzar says. That's supposed to be the attitude of every one of us. Christ is supposed to be our king. We are to live, we are to be in the world, but not of the world. And what you're going to find is the same thing I've found in myself. We are all wondering after the beast. That is the effect that futurism has had on the last three or four generations of Americans to make us dependent on a government that rules at the behest of the papacy, the antichrist of scripture, the man of sin, the little horn, the beast, the antichrist. You see how important this book is, Romanism and the Reformation? Every one of us have a lot of repenting to do, and we have to take an, a, 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 we have to admit the truth. Number one, okay, I, I take it that we're back. Um, we're going to talk now about another church father. This is Irenaeus, and Henry Grattan Guinness says, from Irenaeus, who lived close to the apostolic times, down to Chrysostom and Jerome. The fathers taught that the power withholding the manifestation of the quote-unquote man of sin was the Roman Empire as governed by the Caesars. The fathers, therefore, belonged to the historic and not the futurist school of interpretation. For futurists imagine that the hindrance to the manifestation of the man of sin is still in existence, though the Caesars have long since passed away. The church fathers, the post-apostolic Christians, those who lived and taught and wrote about the scriptures just after the apostolic 
Okay. We've got some uh, malicious interference here, and we're going to continue. God help us. He says again, from Irenaeus, who lived close to the apostolic times, down to Chrysostom and Jerome, the fathers taught that the power withholding the manifestation of the man of sin was the Roman Empire as governed by the Caesars. The fathers, therefore, belonged to the historic, and not to the futurist school of interpretation. For futurists imagine that the hindrance to the manifestation of the man of sin is still in existence, though the Caesars have long since passed away. Now, number six. The early church fathers held that the fall of the Roman Empire was imminent, and therefore the manifestation of Antichrist was close at hand. Justin Martyr, for example, one of the earliest of the fathers, in his Dialogue with Trypho, chapter 32 says, quote, He whom Daniel foretells will... Okay, clearly from this quote, we can see that Justin Martyr expected the rise of Antichrist even in his day. There's no futurism in that, is there? Here is Cyprian. In his exhortation to martyrdom, says this, quote, Since the hateful time of Antichrist is already beginning to draw near, I would collect from the sacred scriptures some exhortations for preparing and strengthening the minds of the brethren, whereby I might animate the soldiers of Christ for the heavenly and spiritual contest, unquote. So clearly, you can see that Cyprian was expecting the imminent fall of the pagan Roman Empire and the rise of the man of sin. And he was wanting to prepare Christians for that event. Now, number seven, <clears throat> The early church fathers held that the man of sin or antichrist would be a ruler or head of the Roman Empire. Okay, we're going to talk about Irenaeus and Hippolytus and their consideration of the mysterious number 666, the number of the revived head of the beast or the antichrist. Irenaeus gives uh, gives as its interpretation the word Latinos, L-A-T-I-N-O-S. That means the Latin man. Okay? He says, quote, Latinos is the number 666, and it is a very probable solution, this being the name of the last kingdom, for the Latins are they who at present bear rule, unquote. So they were expecting Latins or Romans to replace the pagan Caesars. And this Latin, this word Latinos, was a Roman term for the Latin man, and it equals 666. If you take the letters of that word and give their equivalents in Roman numerals and add them up, you get 666. Now, Hippolytus gives the same solution in his treatise on Antichrist and Antichrist, or 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 on Christ and Antichrist. All right, number eight, the fathers held that the Babylon of the Apocalypse, the word Babylon in in John's writing, the Apocalypse, the book of Revelation, it means Rome. And it says, on this point, we were all agreed, and their unanimity is an important seal on the correctness of this interpretation. Tertullian, for example, in his answer to the Jews says, quote, Babylon, in our own John, that is the book of Revelation, is a figure of the city of Rome as being equally great and proud of her sway and triumphant over the saints, unquote. That's in chapter 9 of his work. Now, Victor Rhinus, who wrote the earliest commentary on the Apocalypse on John's book, says on Revelation chapter 17, quote, the seven heads are the seven hills on which the woman sitteth, 
that is, the city of Rome, unquote. Hippolytus says, quote, Tell me, blessed John, apostle and disciple of the Lord, what didst thou see and hear concerning Babylon? Arise and speak, for it sent thee also into banishment, unquote. Who banished? Okay, you notice here the view that Rome, which banished the Apostle John, is the Babylon of the Apocalypse. Now, another one of the church fathers, Augustine, says, quote, Rome, the second Babylon, and the daughter of the first, is which, uh, to, which it is, uh, to which it pleased God to subject the whole world and bring it all under one sovereignty, was now founded. Unquote. Now, even Augustine knew that this Babylon was Rome, and not only that it was Rome, but it was the daughter of the pagan Roman Empire, and that God would use it, or Antichrist would use it, to bring the whole world under one sovereignty, under one ruler. That's the New World Order, folks. Actually, it was the Old World Order. But the New World Order is simply the reestablishment of the Old World Order. One sovereignty, one government, headed by the Pope. Now, in chapter uh, 18, he, he calls Rome, quote, the Western Babylon, unquote. In chapter 41, he says, quote, it has been in vain that this city has re- revived the mysterious name of Babylon, for Babylon is interpreted confusion as... Okay, before we were cut off, I was saying that Babylon, the current modern-day Babylon, Rome, is indeed, just like its, its oriental mother, Babylon, confusion. It has mixed the holy with the profane. It calls itself Christianity, but it is pagan to the core, okay? If we had more time, I could show you that even in the Roman Catholic Encyclopedia, the Roman Catholic Church admits that most of its rituals, even the vestments of the priests and the popes, are derived from pagans. They admit that in the old Roman Catholic Encyclopedia, of which I have a copy. Now, it is clear from these quotations that the, that the fathers, the early church fathers, did not interpret the, the Babylon of the Apocalypse as meaning either the literal Babylon on the, on the Euphrates or some great city in France or England, but as meaning Rome. And this is still the interpretation of the historic school. So for the last 800 years, events have proved Babylon to represent Rome not in its pagan, but in its papal form. It should be noted that none of the early church fathers held the futurist gap theory. As I was saying, none of the early church fathers believed in the gap theory, that there would be 2,000 years between Christ and the rise of Antichrist. None of them believed that. They believed that the Antichrist's appearance in the world was imminent and that it was the papacy. He says it should be noted that none of the fathers held the futurist gap theory. Isn't it Chuck Missler that teaches the gap theory? He calls it the gap. There is no such thing in the scripture. Again, he says it should be noted that none of the fathers held the futurist gap theory the theory that the book of Revelation overleaps or nearly, or, or literally skips nearly 18 centuries of Christian church history, plunging at once into the distant future and devoting itself entirely to the predicting of the events of the last few years of this dispensation. As to the subject of Antichrist, there was a universal agreement among them concerning the general idea of the prophecy. While there were differences as to details, these differences are arising chiefly from the notion that the Antichrist would be in some way Jewish as well as Roman. It is true they thought that the Antichrist would be an individual man. Okay, he says it is true 
The early church fathers thought that the Antichrist would be an individual man. Now, let me just stop right there. Some of the early church fathers did believe that the Antichrist would be an individual man. But certainly, over once the, the rise of Antichrist had manifested itself after the pagan Caesars were thrown down, and that this Roman, this papal Roman Empire continued for 18 centuries, surely, if these early church fathers had lived to see it, they would, they would have abandoned their opinion that the Antichrist was an individual man, but rather a dynasty of Antichrists. Look, Antichrist can't live between its rise at the, at the fall of the pagan Roman Empire and the rise of the papacy, that man can't live for 18 centuries until the return of Christ. It's simply, they simply lived at a time when they could not know. But history has proven that this man of sin, this little horn, this antichrist of the Bible is a dynasty. It's an office. And Though a pope may die, another pope rises in his place and occupies that office. And Okay, it's true that they thought that the Antichrist would be an individual man. He says their early position, that is their early, their, their having lived at an early date in Christian history, sufficiently accounts for this. They had no conception and could have had no conception of the true nature and length of the tremendous apostasy which was to set in upon the Christian church. They were not prophets and could not foresee that the church was to remain 19 centuries in the wilderness and to pass through prolonged and bitter persecution under a succession, under a succession of nominally Christian but apostate rulers, filling the space of the ancient Caesars and emulating their anti-Christian deeds. Had they known these things, we may well believe their views would have completely harmonized with those of historic interpreters of latter times. The fathers went as far as they could go in the direction in which historical interpreters of these last days have traveled. Further, much that was dark to them in prophecy has become clear to their successors in the Okay, we pretty well covered what the early church fathers believed. From the time of the apostles or just after the time of the apostles until the rise of the papacy. Now we're going to move on from the rise of the papacy until that of Pope Gregory the Seventh. We cut, we've talked about the period of time from the early apostolic fathers, that is, those who lived just after the, the apostles, until the rise of Antichrist, the rise of the papacy. Now we're going to talk about the second period, from the rise of the Antichrist, the rise of the papacy, until the papacy of Pope Gregory the Seventh, at the very height of the power of the papacy during the 11th century. He says, we come now in the second place very briefly to review the history of prophetic interpretation in the interval extending between the fall of the Western Roman Empire, that is, the pagan Roman Empire, and the development of the papal theocracy in the 11th century under Pope Gregory VII. The interpreters of this period belong, like the fathers, to the historic school. They interpreted the apocalypse as a prophecy of the whole course of events from the first advent, that is, the first advent of Christ, to the consummation, that is, to the return of Christ. The following authors living in this interval wrote commentaries on the entire apocalypse. Pre, uh, 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 Prometheus, the Venerable Bede, Anspert, Hymo, Andreas, Erythrus, and Berengod. God. Promasius, who lived in the middle of the 6th century, interpreted, quote, 144,000, unquote, 
sealed persons in the apocalypse as the Christian church. Okay? From Primacius believed when the scripture spoke of the 144,000, he was speaking of the Christian church. He held that the Antichrist would substitute himself for Christ and blasphemously assume his dignity, and that the seven-hilled city was Rome. The Venerable Bede, who lived in the north of England at the close of the 11th century, was an historical interpreter of the apocalypse, not a, not a futurist, he was an historicist. Here's a copy of his commentary. He takes the first seal to represent the triumphs and the uh, the triumphs of the primitive church. He expounds the lamb-like beast of Revelation chapter thir- uh, chapter thirteen as a pseudo Christian false prophet. That is a false Christian false prophet. Okay, so you know what he thought of the papacy. Now Ambrose Anspert wrote a copious commentary on the book of Revelation, the Apocalypse, in the middle of the 8th century. He expounds the second beast of Revelation 13 as meaning the preachers and ministers of Antichrist and teaches that Antichrist will be pro-Christo. In other words, he will take Christ's place. And is that not exactly what the papacy calls himself? when he refers to himself as the vicar of Christ, which literally means Christ's replacement. It's a remarkable fact that he expounds the grievous sore or the ulcer poured out under the first vial as meaning infidelity. This is the general view at the present day among historical interpreters. They consider the infidelity of the French Revolution to be the fulfillment of this vial. Hymo's commentary, written in the ninth century, is for the most part abridged by Ansbert. Andreas, who was his, uh, bishop of Caesarea, states definitively that the apocalypse was a prophecy of the things to happen from Christ's first coming to the consummation. He interprets the 144,000 as meaning true Christians and Antichrist to be a Roman king and a pseudo-Christ or a false Christ. Aletheus, who wrote in the ninth century, mainly follows uh, follows the beliefs of Andreas. And Berengod's commentary on the Apocalypse, written in the same century, is the least satisfactory of all, and he was a Benedictine monk, a Roman Catholic monk, and lived at the very dark period. His notion was, that Antichrist would be an, uh, quote, an avowed infidel and an open advocate of licentiousness. And listen, if you study the the history of the papacy, uh, there's a book called, uh, if the name will come to me, Vickers of Christ, the Dark Side of the Papacy by Peter DeRosa. You will see that the history of the popes all throughout these early centuries could be described as nothing but infidel and licentiousness. They were the most wicked, lewd, murderous, blasphemous, adulterous, incestuous demons that ever drew a breath in the world. He continues, he says, he was, as far as is known, the first interpreter to propound this view. The the interval during uh, which these interpreters lived has marked by the steady rise, but not by the full manifestation of the papacy. Two notions contributed powerfully to prevent their recognizing in in the imperfectly developed papacy the predicted man of sin. They imagined that as the Eastern Empire of Rome, seated at Constantinople, now remember the papacy or rather the pagan Roman Caesars left Rome and set up their abode in Constantinople, uh, Istanbul, Turkey today. And they can, they believe that they continue, they continue to let or maintain that their hindrance to the manifestation of Antichrist, completely overlooking the fact that the anti-Christian powerful told in prophecy is de- 
definitely linked with the seven-hilled city of Rome, and thus with the fall of the Western Empire and the apostasy of the Latin or the Western Church. So clearly, you can see that they were historicist in their beliefs. They were wrong about a few things, owing to the fact that they were very early and could not see how things were being fulfilled. But we, in our day, have no excuse to get this wrong. We have all of history to verify what the early church fathers believed. And that's why Walt and I talk so much about history. It's history that has been written out of the school books. It's been written out of the history books. It's been written out of the mainstream media. The government won't say anything about it, and neither will the churches today. They want you to believe a lie. They want you to believe a futurist lie. They do not want you to see the papacy as the fulfillment of Antichrist. They want to unite the whole world under Antichrist. And in order to do that, they have to, they have to blank this history from any knowledge among God's people, and we have to restore it. That is essential for people in, who call themselves Christians today who are deceived by this futurist malarkey just to see the true history of the papacy in the Roman Catholic Church and to return to their Protestant beliefs, then God can help us. If we do not relent of our hold on futurism and return to the pure gospel of Jesus Christ and separate ourselves unto him, he cannot help us. That's a hideous reality. It isn't just about knowing these things. It's about doing something. We have to repent. We cannot eat from Nebuchadnezzar's table. We cannot serve two masters. We have to separate ourselves. And we have to cling to Christ and him only. Continuing, he says, then they spiritualized and explained away a great deal of prophecy and supposed that they were living in the millennium and that the Antichrist would not be manifested until the brief outbreak of evil at the very close. This false notion had fatal consequences. Listen, futurism tried to raise its ugly head early, and this author, and surely he would it would be agreeable to the early church fathers would say this false notion futurism had fatal consequences while these interpreters in common with the generality of Christians of their period were looking for the advent of the man of sin in the distant future he stole unperceived into their midst and usurped the place of Christ over his unwatchful flock we're guilty of the same sin. Unwatchful flocks. We have to repent. It says, before we leave this medieval period, there are three remarkable testimonies to which we must just refer. Gregory the Great of the 6th century declared before Christendom that whosoever called himself universal bishop or universal priest was the precursor of Antichrist. In this, he was doubtless correct, uh, perfectly correct. Now, this Pope Gregory the Great, 6th century, knew that this is exactly where the papacy was going, that the papacy was going to declare itself the universal bishop and that the claim of universal bishopric over the church would be the precursor of Antichrist. So you, you have from the, the very mouth of a 6th century pope predicting that the papacy would be a, at least a precursor to Antichrist if it claimed itself universal bishopric, uh, the universal bishop of the church. And that's precisely what the papacy did. He says, in this, he was doubtless perfectly correct. 
And when Pope Boniface III, shortly after the death of Gregory, took this title in the year 607, he became the precursor of Antichrist, as fully revealed under Pope Boniface VIII. Under Pope Boniface VIII. So here you have, and if you, if you comprehend what, what I have just read, you have to believe that God is even using the mouth of the papacy itself to proclaim itself as Antichrist. Listen again. Gregory the Great of the 6th century, Pope Gregory the Great in the 6th century, declared before all Christendom that whosoever called himself universal bishop or universal priest was the precursor of Antichrist. In this, he was doubtless perfectly correct. When Pope Boniface III, shortly after the death of Pope Gregory the Great, took this title in the year 607, he became the precursor of Antichrist, as fully revealed under Pope Boniface VIII. And what's the significance of Pope Boniface VIII? He said that it was necessary for every man to be subject to the Roman pontiff for salvation. Out of the out of the, the mouths of the popes, even the pope, Pope Gregory the Great, in the sixth century, said whoever would call himself the universal bishop or the universal priest, which the papacy always claims, all popes claim this, all throughout history, not in the future, but all throughout papal history. They claim themselves to be the universal bishop, in other words, bishop of bishops, the bishop, the supreme bishop over all the other bishops of the church, and the universal priest, the priest of priests. Those are titles that the papacy carries for itself. And it was Pope Gregory the the Great of the 6th century that predicted that this would happen. And it was Pope Boniface VIII who said, it is necessary for salvation for every man to be subject to the Roman pontiff. We've run out of time for this week. My apologies to the listeners for so many interruptions. Now you know what it was like for me on ham radio. They simply don't want to hear the truth. They won't allow the truth to be spoken at least not without interruption. For now, it's just interruption and maliciousness and interference. Tomorrow, it will be beheadings. Come, Lord Jesus. We must start at the foot of the cross. For our souls in danger, we're at loss. And when we kneel in that awesome place, at that very moment, you'll feel God's grace. Friend, let me tell you, you need to know, there is heaven, also hell below. Christ died on that cross to set you free from your vile sins and hell's agony. You're God's enemy without the cross. Reject Christ and to God your dross. To the prison of hell he will send, just Christ's work on the cross makes amends. God hates those who try to enter in, the gates of heaven still full of sin. Only his son can take sin away, go to the foot of the cross this day. God has provided only one way to enter heaven's wondrous array. Except what Jesus did for us all, he paid our debt so hell won't befall. Go to the foot of the cross this day, his precious blood washes sin away. We each need to think more of his cross, without our Savior we're total loss.